Mahani, uh, respected uh, Titan Dr. Mahana, uh, President Dr. Joseph, uh, and members of the past and present members of the Board of uh, uh, Management of the MBA. And it's a great honor and uh, privilege to introduce uh, today's speaker and who is a multifaceted personality. So the biodata what uh, I prepared or sent is not actually enough to really give the uh, various facets of this uh, good human being. Now, Dr. Ajit Pidhi, so as an alumnus of St. John's Medical College and Nimhans, Bangalore, and currently he's an emeritus consultant in psychiatry at St. Martha's Hospital, Bangalore, where he has been working for the past 34 years and had introduced the family medicine program there. First of all, the Ask for, ask for Sir, Dr. Murli, yeah. so we are not able to hear you when you turn, so could you just... Yes, uh, yes. Now, now it's uh, I am going to turn. Uh, here, the advocacy committee, boundary uh, violation task force, uh, task force on LGBT, mental health, uh, LGBT mental health, and in the past, and also past literary editor of the Indian General of Psychiatry. Uh, and he has been actually a very, very good organizer. And he had organized uh, the national level conferences. And of course, he is an extremely efficient and benevolent leader uh, among the psychiatry group. And that's so how he has led the Indian Psychiatry Society in 2018, 2019, in an exemplary fashion. And Dr. Ajit Bide uh, also, the founding convener of the Indian Association of Private Psychiatrists. And later he became the president of the Indian Association of Private Psychiatry, Karnataka. And popular speaker at public and professional fora on various mental health issues. His areas of interest are personality disorders, anxiety disorders, youth mental health, psychotherapy, evolutionary psychology, preventive psychiatry, General Hospital Psychiatry, actively interested in literature, performing arts, and Indian history and music cuisine. And he has 27 publications and over 40 CMA presentations. More than that, I would like to take a few more minutes to uh, introdu uh, introduce Ajit. Uh, when I joined Nimhans 1980, that is about uh, 42 years back, uh, we are looking at a senior of ours, immediate senior. Dr. Ajit Bide, and uh, somebody told me that there is a model who is working here and he used to come in advertisements. And later, once we introduced to each other and uh, uh, becoming more and more closer, we came to know that Ajit has a multifaceted personality of very active uh, talent in acting as well as uh, very actively involved at in the Bangalore theaters and then uh, orator and he is the person who has actually given me an idea of how to present a seminar without actually using much of audiovisual aids at a one particular stage. Uh, Ajit had presented an excellent uh, seminar on personality disorders, especially the antisocial personality, and which was uh, very, uh, very well attended and very uh, well understood topic at that point of time, even though it was a very difficult topic. So with this uh, few uh, thing, and uh, of course he also uh, writes and is a voracious reader, and with all these things and being a good Just a minute, I'll uh, just get my presentation in uh, order.
I have slightly modified my topic for today into speaking about mental health, the role of parents, rather than the role of parents in positive in, uh, mental health and mental uh, mental well-being and mental ill health. <clears throat> Parenting has been a subject of deep study, scientifically well scrutinized, especially in the past five decades. Now, what role does parenting play in a person's behavior, in this person's emotional repertoire, in the person's attitudes? And overall, do we understand that parenting is either overrated or underrated? These are some of the important issues, and not only these, will I be touching on in the course of the next half hour or so. Now, Rimbaud was the uh, psychologist who went about studying parenting patterns, and she, with her group, came across certain uh, observations about parenting, and she classified parenting broadly into three categories. We may speak of these as authoritative, authoritarian, and permissive. Her group, after her time, after her time in the sense while she was still around, added another uh, facet of uh, parenting pattern, and that was a neglectful parenting. So if we broadly look at parenting patterns, we have four, diamond, uh, four uh, categories over here. We can look at them in two, uh, in two dimensions. On one dimension, we have warmth. On the other dimension, we have understanding. So if there is, on the x-axis, so to say, a warm and accepting attitude versus a cold and unaccepting attitude, on the other y-axis, we have a very understanding attitude, and then understanding merges into a demanding attitude. And here we get four patterns of parenting. In the first quadrant, we have the warm and accepting, yet a demanding pattern, which is the authoritative pattern. Closely related to, but quite distinct, when this warmth and acceptance is uh, not there, it becomes a cold and unaccepting pattern with still a demanding attitude that is called the authoritarian pattern. The authority is the common element between these two, but these are still quite distinct. Then we have a warm and accepting, probably a little too warm and sometimes far too accepting attitude with very little demand being placed on the young person by the parent, and that becomes a permissive type of parenting. On the other hand, related to this in, the, in terms of being uh, undemanding and quite uh, cold and unaccepting, we have a dimension, we have a quadrant called the neglectful type of parenting. So authoritative, authoritarian, neglectful and permissive if we go clockwise. The authoritative pattern is generally considered one of the most healthy patterns of parenting where a parent establishes her or his authority to say, I am boss, but I will listen to everybody, but final decision making will be by me. The authoritarian, here too, the authority of the parent is very firmly asserted, but here there is no question of accommodating other points of view, of a democratic setup where other points of view are taken into consideration. It is do as I say, because I am boss, that kind of attitude. The third category, is neglectful, where parenting is practically abandoned. There is no question of parents paying enough attention to the need of the young person, and this can cause havoc in the young person's life. On the other hand, you have some parents who are extremely yielding, extremely accepting of every one of the young person's demands, and this is called permissive parenting. I've already said, and I will expand on this, authoritative parenting is something which begets respect from the young person, and that respect is commanded, not demanded. In the authoritarian pattern, on the other hand, obedience and adherence to the diktats of the boss are demanded, they're not quite commanded. Young people grow up respecting an authoritative parent, Young people grow up generally dreading an authoritarian parent 
and at some point there could be a phase of rebellion about rebellion we might have something to say a little later when we look at uh, parenting patterns and their outcomes in the long run neglectful parenting very commonly happens because of bad socio economic circumstances where people don't have the time the energy the psychological sophistication to pay attention to the needs that the young person has in terms of what kind of parenting should be bestowed upon them permissive parenting leads to spoiled brats these are people who cannot take no for an answer and this happened we noticed a lot in china anthony clare the irish psychiatrist studied uh, uh, chinese families over a period of 3 decades and he found that as the one child norm came in economic prosperity which was sort of imposed in a sense because people had only one child and they could afford to give the child everything he wanted what happened we had a generation of young people completely spoiled unable to take no for an answer and significantly the amount of depression these people underwent because whenever their demands were not met they tended to go uh, down in terms of the mood and attempted suicide was much more common among them so this is what we've learned about parenting uh, patterns and how they beget different aspects of mental health if we come back to our own country and we always hark back to uh, ancient indian wisdom particularly in the present uh, uh, era where we think we had everything before anybody else and anything that was claimed by anybody else we already had it but let's not dwell too much on that an ancient indian model of ideal parenting a shloka says lalayet pancha varshani dasha varshani taadayet prapte shodashe varshe putre mitra padachare what does this mean lalayet pancha varshani that means for the first 5 years indulge him pamper him give him to give him whatever he needs give him whatever he asks for as far as possible dasha varshani taadaye what does taadaye mean taadaye means thrash him spank him when he crosses 5 till he becomes 10 uh so this is not correct this should be till he becomes 15 uh, for the next 10 years he should be spanked in reality what is implied is that these are the years when disciplining has to set in and once he has crossed 15 turning 16 prapte shodashe varshe that is when you attain 16 years he should be treated like a friend putram mitra vadachare that means you address him as a friend and this is the ancient indian model now this bit about taadayet dasha varshani taadayet is not something which is very exclusively to india because even the bible had this to say we have changing paradigms in uh, parenting and the bible gives us this uh, grand notion of spare the rod and spoil the child so you have over here i will discipline you with a rod and you will be saved in other words for you to be if, uh, 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 a proper son of god what you need to do is be highly strictly disciplined and for that punitive methods of control punitive methods of disciplining were advocated we've seen a shift in the paradigm of disciplining and of uh, uh, parenting in general and we've come to a stage where a young person can just lie lounge about on the sofa and the poor mother who's at a wits end trying to get father and child to bond says if you can't bond with him at least like him on the social media such a crying need among young people of today to be wanted and that feeling of want comes from a feeling of being liked and those liked likes have to be manifest by gaining likes on your social media uh, coverage either of your own pictures or of the witty thing you said or the witty thing you claim to have said because we live in a psychologically attuned age and a rapidly changing world we need to adapt our attitudes to disciplining in particular and parenting in general we have today this phenomenon and i was surprised to learn that this term which i thought was somewhat new is actually a very very old term it was first used in the late 1960s by a young man in an interview to a tv host and he said my parents are hovering around me all the time as though they are in a helicopter watching every one of my moves now these are not bad parents they they are well intentioned parents well meaning parents who are now governing every monitoring every action of the young person 
These are the helicopter parents, uh, so to say. And what do these helicopter parents really have at heart? They have the child's well-being at heart. Please remember the path to hell is paved with good intentions. And these people, the parents, want to look after the child so closely, prevent him from having any sort of danger in his life, want to ensure that he pursues healthy uh, targets, both in his curricular and in his extracurricular life, to see that he does not waste any time, to see that he's not with bad company, to see that he's not being tempted by uh, the lure of drugs and other uh, vices so rampantly attendant on young people's lives these days. Now, if we look at how parents affect their offspring, and we are really in the realm of mental health, there are three important uh, facets I'd like to mention. One is, of course, the genes. The genes are what little we can do about those genes. We will be referring to genes repeatedly, but I will not emphasize genes way too much today because there's precious little we can do about what we inherit by way of genetic material from our parents. There is, of course, for the last four decades, the exciting science of epigenetics, which tells us the genes are important, but genes are not the be all and end all of everything, because there are modifying uh, factors called, uh, which, which we collectively um, put under the rubric of epigenetics. But we won't talk about that much today, because those are not things which non scientists really deal with. But there is modeling that happens. And very interestingly, there's something called negative modeling that also goes on. Let's look at these two phenomena, modeling and negative modeling in some detail. Modeling, now you see here, the young person trying to do everything that her father seems to be doing sitting beside him. She seems to, she's simulating holding a phone. She's simulating having a conversation. And not only that, observe her limbs. She's adopted exactly the same position as her uh, parent has adopted over here. Uh, the, the visual isn't too clear, but she wants to do everything. It's through imitation that a lot of behavior is learned, both good and as we shall see, not so good. Children tend to imitate their parents and this imitation starts around the second or third year of age. And this imitation is not necessarily gender specific. This is not gender specific till about five or six years of age. And when I was a postgraduate student, it was, uh, stated that children tended to imitate the parent of the same gender. So girls would imitate their mother, boys would imitate their father. And this is what developmental psychology folks used to tell us in those days. Mind you, these gender specific roles are now changing quite a lot. Quite often, the mother is a major breadwinner in the family. The father is quite commonly perhaps forced into it, but a good cook, and it doesn't have to be the mother who has to be the one in charge of the kitchen all the time. So this change that happens, this is not gender specific till about five or six years. And even then, it does not have to conform to a gender specific pattern in today's world. A child is more likely to identify with and imitate a particularly liked parent. So this liking is governed by the kind of nurturance the child perceives coming from the parent, and invariably, much as we may dislike to admit it, there are like the, uh, the greater fairy, favored parent, and that, may, that can change from time to time. Most of the time it's one parent, sometimes it's the other parent, or it may be an even 50-50 divide. Attitudes and manifest behavior can considerably gener be generated from such imitation, and we call such imitation that the child has modeled herself or himself after the parent, as we saw that young lady with the telephone, as with the mobile phone. As adolescence sets in the offspring, especially in societies that have liberal attitudes, that do give freedom to young people to express themselves adequately and accommodate disagreeing attitudes among young people. So what happens in such societies? Adolescence is marked by a period during which the values that have been passed down to the young people are now questioned the values as well as the mores of the parents will be questioned. Quite a few through this questioning will then go through a phase of rebellion. Remember I said that referred to rebellion against, and this is called the adolescent rebellion phase. So quite a few go through a phase of rebellion against parental 
behaviors and parental expectations. Fortunately, much of such re uh, rebellion resolves by the time the person is in his young adult. Now, what happens? What, what exactly are the values that children pick up from parents? And this is not uh, merely common sense, though it conforms to what uh, common sense might uh, uh, dictate to us. There is adequate research to suggest that positive things that can come from modeling include kindness, and kindness can go on to generosity. And both of these combined can go on to what is very important for those of us in the mental health professions, a feeling of empathy. Also, forgiveness, the act of forgiving, is something which children can very well pick up from their uh, parents. Also, an attitude where humor becomes part of the person's repertoire, the uh, lightheartedness that is very important to healthy mental life can be modeled after a parent who has that attitude. Adhering to norms of time specificity, being punctual, being on time, is something that is picked up from parents through modeling. On the other hand, if a parent has negative qualities, these two can very easily be picked up by the child, both consciously and unconsciously. What are these negative qualities? Mainly in the realm of emotional life, irritability, very, very important, suspiciousness. There are parents who are always on the vigil, always on the lookout for what might go wrong, always on the lookout for what might be against their personal safety and their family's safety. And this is quickly imbibed by the young person. When I say imbibed, I'm not necessarily, again, implying a conscious mechanism. A tendency to feel low, down and out, sometimes in the face of very uh, trivial stresses. This despondency is something that can again be picked up. Carelessness and untidiness, both not generally speaking good qualities to have in one's uh, psychological life, are attitudes that can be picked up by children through modeling. So suffice it to say that modeling is a very important mechanism and modeling bestows on us possibly very good qualities, but there is a danger of the not so good ones too. Oscar Wilde, the wit and great writer and playwright had this to say, children begin by loving their parents. As they grow older, they judge them. Sometimes they forgive them. I would even uh, paraphrase that to say, rarely do they forgive them. This is, this is something which is greatly true. I've, I've had this uh, presented when I used to do workshops with younger people, usually at the pre-university and uh, degree level. And most young people identified with this saying quite a lot, that in their younger days, they adore their parents. As they grow older, they see that these are not gods. They have feet of clay. There are faults among their parents. And they find faults which they say, I have now got from my parent. And because of my father was like that, I am like this. Because my mother did not behave in a particular fashion, I've turned out like this. So they judge them. And not only do they judge them, rarely do they forgive the parents for what they have turned out to be. Now, something about negative modeling. When people were researching the phenomenon of alcoholism, they noticed a peculiar pattern that occurred in some individuals. There were individuals who were the offspring of very hardcore alcoholics who were absolutely uh, uh, teetotal. These teetotalers were in a cavalier fashion dedicated to never touching alcohol, and they had a very uh, rabid attitude towards, uh, to, uh, towards castigating other people who had an alcohol uh, problem. What had happened? Among these were a lot of young men who had seen their father behaving in an obnoxious fashion come the weekend when there was no control over the amount of liquor the father was imbibing. And as a result of this, uh, uh, inebriation, the alcoholic father used to behave in a fashion that used to embarrass the family. There was abuse, there was verbal abuse, sometimes there was physical abuse, 
there was uh, uh, suspiciousness, there was violence in the family. And the young person growing up noticed this, associated, associated this behavior with the father's drinking, and then turned in an almost uh, pathological fashion against liquor, radically against liquor, so much so that you have this paradoxical phenomenon of teetotaling among offspring of alcoholics. Here, while modeling is based on imitation, exactly the opposite is happening. What happens? These are people who will never ever dream of having alcohol in their house or alcohol in their system uh, be damned, uh, no, no, no chance at all. So that, 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 this is something which we have to be aware of, that negative modeling has now shaped this person as almost a uh, championing the cause against alcohol. Similarly, we notice that parents who have been rather liberal with their money, very generous in sharing their assets, eventually find in this family, young people who say, Papa was so generous with his money. He gave away too much of his money. As a result, we didn't have the goodies we ought to have that ought to have come to us. And I am not going to be this way. I am not going to share my uh, material well-being so easily. So I'm going to be very frugal in my attitude to uh, money and material well-being. I will not be a generous person. This might seem in contradiction to what we had said earlier, that in the course of modeling, generosity can indeed be modeled. But these are by and large the exception. Suffice it for us to know just now that negative modeling can shape our attitudes to different spheres of life. And then in this age, like we said, Lalaye, Panchavarshani, Dashavarshani, Tadaye, in a similar fashion, we live in an age where we unfortunately have this phenomenon of saying everything about our country is so great. A couple of years ago, I picked this up from the net and I was uh, very amused by what was uh, uh, available from this particular post on the net. And they said that Indian parents are different. How are they different? They are different. The claim was that Indian parents foster kinship. They bring in good family ties. Indian parents make a lot of sacrifice. And mind you, this was in contrast to non-subcontinental parents. They did not say so. They said Western in a very vague fashion. Indian parents build a trustworthy and friendly relationship. It was claimed that Indian parents tend to spend quality time with their children. Indian parents nurture talents. Indian parents, uh, they had to have something negative, so they brought this in. They are nosy at times. Indian parents embed religious tolerance. Indian parents can be judgmental. And non-Indian parents. Now this is net wisdom. And I don't think we have to have this notion that parenting in India is much better than parenting uh, in certain other parts of the world. I, th I think uh, this is a gross overstatement, but mind you, it also taught me how careful one has to be about taking stuff from the net. And this was actually uh, uh, something I came across and we had discussions about this with young people who uh, had lots of things to say. For example, in the realm of spending quality time, so many young people complain that their parents do not spend time, that parents do not do enough to nurture the talents that they, the, the young person may have. You mentioned already that the path to hell is paved with good intentions. And quite often, I have seen parents snuff out talents in the young person because they want their child to do a particular academic uh, uh, course, which they think will put bread and butter on the table, which will be good for them in the long run. They even go to the extent, of course, as we know, choosing their life partners, a phenomenon which is largely changing, but is still very much over there. So I, I don't think we should go away with this Pushpak Vimana philosophy that everything about India and Indian parents is just fantastic. From here, we'll move to looking at certain unhealthy patterns of parental interaction. I've taken my presentation from three other uh, presentations that I had occasion to make earlier. And uh, one of them was on the genesis of schizophrenia. Now, there was a gentleman called Theodore Litz, a very distinguished professor of psychiatry at Yale University. And this was something which was just going out of fashion 
when we had moved into doing our post-graduation in psychiatry. Theodor Lids looked at two patterns of parental interaction. They were called the marital schism and the marital skew. Now, schism, as the term implies, is where the parents behave in diametrically opposite ways, or they have diametrically opposite attitudes, diametrically opposite behaviors, and that causes confusion in the young person's mind, and this person becomes immobilized, and as a result of this, may become quite dysfunctional. Lids believed that this kind of schism led to a breakdown in the person's psychological functioning, so much so he lost his touch with reality and had that devastating illness that at, time, that at that time was called schizophrenia. We'll have more to say about schizophrenia in just a little while. And sometimes there was a marital skew. One parent allowed the other to dominate so that there would be peace at home. This kind of skewing also led to a person's identification with the uh, overpowering parent, and that again caused psychological instability and led to a different kind of schizophrenia. Now, suffice it to say that these are not healthy patterns of parental interaction, certainly, but do they lead to schizophrenia? I think that's a gross overstatement if ever there was. Then there are two other phenomena. There is something called pseudo-mutuality and pseudo-hostility. Pseudo-mutuality is an unhealthy pattern wherein superficially everything seems to be very fine, but deep down there is deep resentment in each parent about the other. On the other hand, there are some families where both parents will deliberately seem to be hostile or opposed to the other, whereas in fact, if you study them in some depth, there is not that much of a difference between them. And these kind of uh, this kind of an unhealthy pattern of uh, uh, parental interaction with pseudo-mutuality and pseudo-hostility. Sometimes it, within the same uh, dyad, the, uh, 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 one changes to the other, but that's uncommon. Led to emotional instability, and that was believed to underlie both schizophrenia and what is called affective disorder. Then there was this great uh, anthropologist called Gregory Bateson. And Gregory Bateson gave us the notion of the double bind. And what do we mean by double bind? Double bind means one emotion is conveyed in, uh, conveyed in words, another emotion is conveyed in motor behavior, facial expression, and overall attitude. And this causes confusion to the young person, causing a psychotic breakdown. Then there is finally the phenomenon of scapegoating, where one person is victimized and made to feel that he or she is responsible for everything that is uh, going wrong. This again is uh, something that has uh, uh, roots in uh, uh, the classics and uh, re religious literature. Suffice it to say that these are bad patterns of parental interaction, but important for us to remember, these are not the basic mechanisms that beget psychotic breakdown in the young person. Now, do parents cause mental illness in children? Certainly, we've already mentioned the importance of genes, and we will be mentioning this uh, over and over again, because there is no gain saying the fact that genes are a very important field of research in our times, but equally important contributors to mental illness. The illnesses we will look at, schizophrenia, now called the schizophrenia, because it's believed that it's not a single syndrome. The emotional disorders, collectively called the affective disorders. Very prominent among these is the illness of depression. And sometimes depression is complicated by another phenomenon of emotional disturbance called mania, where the person is highly excitable, over talkative, uh, uh, tending to spend a lot of money. An undue sense of happiness seems to accompany many of these people. If it's not happiness, then it is irritability. And sometimes happiness and irritability come together. But if there is this fluctuation in these uh, mood levels, and we call it a bipolar disorder. Anxiety disorders, where the overriding emotion is one of anxiety. And deeply ingrained patterns of behavior and emotion that are not suitable for healthy survival. These are the personality disorders. These are uh, four facets that we look at in some detail. I haven't the time to go into great detail. Then, of course, there are other important psychological uh, uh, 
uh, disturbances, psychological illnesses called the psychobiological dis uh, disorders, which affect our sleep, appetite, eating behaviors, uh, excretory functions, sexual functions. We haven't the time to. Now, the, with the schizophrenias, genes play a very major role in the genesis of this group of conditions. Suffice it to say that in the general population, if you find, if you did a survey and found that how we are looking for how many people have Then, but look at the reverse side of this. The chances of not having it among in the general population is about 99 out of 100. The chances of not having it among blood relatives is about 90 in 100. One to 10 looks. scary, 99 to significant uh, unhealthy patterns of parenting. For a long time, it was believed that bad parenting, the so-called schizophrenogenic mother, the cold, calculating, indif emotionally indifferent, even when providing good nur nurturance, was a certain kind of mother who begot a schizophrenic child on account of her uh, refrigerator attitude, as it was called. Please get rid of this notion if at all you have it and please dismiss it from anybody else's uh, understanding of schizophrenia there is no such thing as a schizophrenogenic mother we have dismissed the schizophrenic uh, schizophrenogenic mother altogether we're looking at schizophrenia as a biochemical illness largely determined by the genetic makeup of this individual and bad parenting is not a determinant of schizophrenia from here we move on to the emotional disorders. We mentioned depression, we mentioned <coughs> bipolar disorders. Genes are important in bringing about these disorders as well. But more than schizophrenia, environmental stresses are much more important in emotional disorders and causing somebody to have an episode of depression or go into a bipolar uh, kind of illness. Environmental stresses do play a role and that environmental stress might actually be parent-child interaction, but very seldom is it that simple. From here, you move on to the anxiety disorders in which there are three principal categories. Generalized anxiety, where anxiety is continuously present in uh, this person's life. There may be a particular onset after which this generalized anxiety is there, or there could be short bursts of anxiety which are called panic attacks. And if panic attacks are not accompanied by generalized anxiety, it is called a panic disorder. The third kind of anxiety disorder is where the anxiety is very specific for certain situations. For example, facing the opposite gender. I'm very scared of facing women. Or I'm very scared of high places. Or I'm very scared of closed spaces. They make me feel very queasy and I, I cannot afford to be in a overcrowded BMTC bus, for instance. These are called phobic disorders. Now, again and again and again, the importance of genes, I will emphasize, but at the same time, in these disorders, especially in generalized anxiety and in phobic anxiety, modeling, which we spoke about earlier, may contribute significantly in generating this disorder. It isn't as though you see a parent with anxiety and immediately you become anxious. It sort of incubates in this young person and gets manifest at a certain age later in life. And here we come to personality disorders. Parental behavior and personality do seem to contribute more than to any other disorders uh, in the realm of personality disorders. Even so, here too, we cannot ignore the importance of genes. Uh, sorry. So, the three personality disorders for our convenience were very neatly clustered into cluster A, which is characterized by the odd eccentric cluster, 
Cluster B is a dramatic, unpredictable cluster. And the third important cluster is the anxious, fearful cluster. Across these clusters, modeling seems to have an important role. How do we know modeling has an important role? If we had children who were brought up by parents other than their biological parents, then we'd know for sure that if there is a commonality between the biological parent who has been separated from the individual, these are called the adoption studies, and we look at young people who have grown away from their biological parents and both have a commonality, then possibly a genetic factor plays a role. But if the genetic factor has been more or less ruled out, then environmental factors are the big getters of this disorder, very, very likely. And here, paranoid personality, most importantly, here, the antisocial personality and the borderline personality, to a lesser extent, the narcissistic personality, the avoidant personality, these are highly shy individuals, dependent personality, people who cannot make up their minds for themselves, they need somebody else to do it for them. These are the uh, particular uh, types of personality disorders where parental behavior does contribute significantly to this disorder arising in the young person. From here we'll move on to another realm that is the parental mental illness and children. There are a large number of parents who are themselves mentally of unsound health. You see this very telling graphic before you of a young boy wondering what has happened to his father. Mental illness is parent, in parents is quite common. Parents with mental illness can provide many challenges to their children if they do not receive adequate treatment for their own disease. And this includes both pharmacological treatment, drug treatment, and also adequate support systems and adequate counseling and psychotherapy. These are very important. If these are denied to the mentally ill parent, then the challenges become even more. Parenting skills are compromised to varying degrees by mental illness in the parent. Children often face embarrassment, anger, shame, and quite commonly they are stigmatized by the fact that the parent has a uh, mental illness. Some young people, especially those who are not properly guided, can even take the uh, onus of guilt on themselves. I am responsible somehow for what is going wrong. And I must, be, I must have behaved badly, which causes my parent to have this mental illness. Not an uncommon phenomenon, as many of my clinician friends would agree, that they take the burden on themselves. How does a parent's uh, illness impact the child's development? With many young people, there's a feeling of inadequacy. One young person described this as the world seems to be falling apart around me. There is a loss of trust. And this loss of trust gets manifest in difficulty in forming and maintaining close relationships. The young person has a, generally speaking, a lowered sense of self-esteem. And we've already mentioned emotional reactions such as shame, anger, and despondency. Some extraordinarily sensitive and emotionally intelligent children may attempt to take over the role of a caregiver. And I wrote about this uh, in the lay press a few years ago that they take over the role of a caregiver. I had a 16 year old who used to bring his uh, paranoid schizophrenic, chronic paranoid schizophrenic mother to me. And uh, it was really remarkable the way this young man uh, looked after his mother. But they take, in a, in a rather uh, taxing fashion, a role of an adult is imposed on these young people when they start performing the role of a caregiver. Others will withdraw from intimacy. Uh, this, this with others is, uh, superfluous, please ignore that. Others will withdraw from intimacy as well as activities that they used to enjoy because of they feel so ashamed or they feel so stigmatized by the illness in the parent. We haven't time to look into all the uh, illnesses that could uh, come in a uh, parent's uh, life, but let's look at one particular very well done study. This is a, a group from America led by uh, a social worker turned psychologist, uh, Myrna Weissman, and her group in the United States, who have followed up the children of depressed parents and followed them up first for 20 years, then for 30 years. The most recent publication, as far as I'm aware, was, the, was uh, in 2016, a 30 year follow up. And what did they find? 
the offspring of depressed parents remain at a high risk for depression for other morbidities as well as mortality so not only is there a higher risk of depression there is a higher risk of physical illness that can go on to uh, death that persist into the middle years while adolescence is the major period for the onset of major depression in these people in both the low risk and the high risk groups that is those who have a family history of depression in the parents and those who do not have such a history uh, or vice versa rather it is the offspring with family history who go on to have recurrent depression very important to remember and a poor outcome as they mature something very very significant and what exactly is that significant in this era of personalized medicine until a more biologically based understanding of individual risk is found a simple family history assessment of major depression in other words we must check out does this person's parent either one of them uh, uh, have a clear history of depression as part of the uh, clinical uh, care can be the predictor of individuals at long term risk in other words always take the chance of depression among relatives um, among the offspring of uh, already detected uh, depressed persons very very seriously just to lighten the moment let's go to this uh, american wit who says insanity is hereditary you get it from your children i think a lot of parents who have difficult children will agree with this that sometimes children can be so difficult you're tearing your hair apart trying to get to uh, understand how to deal with them and it's almost as as though you've gone insane some important considerations that matter alongside parenting social economic status i think this is something which we tend not to pay adequate attention to there are families that have a great deal of deprivation in terms of facilities for recreation in terms of facilities even for nutrition and that without a doubt can contribute to compromises in parenting compromises in the kind of nurturance that the parent would like to give to the child also with socio economic status comes socio educational status and if parents if parents are from a deprived background where they do not understand the needs for healthy parenting then again the young person is clearly uh, at the receiving end of some very uh, bad outcomes the milieu of the family the kind of neighborhood in which the person is dwelling here again what amenities are available is available to that particular uh, strata is very important and overall is this a healthy family is this a family that enjoys time together is this a family which enjoys interaction more than anything else healthy interaction mind you then there are variations in family patterns in this country especially we find that the extended family is still pretty much common though it is no longer the norm as it used to be when i was a postgraduate the extended family and the presence of grandparents who are surrogate parents in very many ways most of the time they contribute to a healthy home atmosphere and a sharing of the responsibility of parenting grandparents can be very great additional or surrogate parents and then again the family size especially with bad socio economic status they tend to have large families because survival means one more hand to help and that that, that used to be the state especially in rural india which is considerably abating now though very very slowly so if you have many more siblings we already gave the example of china where the one child norm came in and greater comforts could be afforded by parents to their offspring if there are lots of people to share the same round of rotis then each one is deprived but even even there attitude can be an overriding factor then there are two special categories of parents that uh, parental interactions and parents that i'd like to consider children of divorce the good news is that by and large it seems from whatever data has accrued to us in the last 70 years or so it seems that children of divorce do not necessarily suffer mental illness or mental breakdown to the extent we used to think happens but there are two important caveats provided it's a single parent family where that single parent has an extremely robust resilient 
happy, not easily broken down, mental attitude, then the child turns out to be quite healthy. And we have a number of examples of this, both from the lay literature as well as in uh, uh, studies of individuals. However, if that single parent has a pathological personality constitution and a tendency not to be resilient, then the outcome is quite, quite, quite different. Again, if a father has gone away and it, somebody substitutes the role of the father, a stepfather who comes in by way of remarriage, if that step parent's attitude is one of, uh, is a healthy one, then again, this deprivation of one parent figure is something compensated by the uh, uh, new person who has stepped in. And we know that when you have that kind of a dyad available, the chances of a better mental health outcome is generally established. There is one subcategory that, uh, or rather a subheading I'd like to uh, dwell on, and this is the parental alienation syndrome, a syndrome which, uh, the existence of which has been questioned, but to my mind, it definitely exists, having seen at least seven cases at close quarters. What happens over here is that after the divorce, one parent so turns the mind of the young person, uh, the offspring, totally against the other parent that has either an overtly hostile or at least a rather negative attitude towards that parent now starts developing so that the child begins to abhor the other parent and this can make for psychological breakdown of various degrees and various kinds. This parental alienation syndrome, though it has been questioned, is something I fully endorse as an entity and which can be quite dangerous and something which is so very avoidable with proper counseling. Just as we had good news for children of divorce, by and large, children who have been taken in adoption do turn out to be mentally healthy. If the family that has adopted them has a healthy attitude interpersonally and intrapersonally, they have a good repertoire of resilience and the ability to face stress in a healthy fashion. So for both children of divorce and children of adoption, the news is not uh, nearly as devastating as we were given to believe. However, again, harking back to the genes, we have to say that if the biological uh, parents have certain uh, hassles in their mental constitution, then those might show up in the adopted uh, child as well. Before we wind up, two quick uh, uh, phenomena that we need to look at. One is violence in the family. And there are families besotted, uh, sorry, uh, which, where we see a lot of domestic violence. And that domestic violence makes for young persons to imbibe this value, saying that, ah, it's a father's job to beat up the mother. Whether in a drunken state or not is a, mood, is a separate question, but we leave that aside for the time. They imbibe this value of violence as uh, manifest virility, manifest strength, that can be quite uh, dangerous. Violence in the family occurs especially with antisocial personality disorders, but it's not exclusive to that. And we know that antisocial personality disorder in the father very commonly begets a conduct disorder of a severe nature in the child. Then again, there is an issue of sexuality and mental health. We live in a rather, rather liberal age, and any form of sexual behavior between two consenting adults now is supposed to be not to be graded as unhealthy. So homosexuality, bisexuality, transgender are now people who be accommodated in society as normal. And this is something that still needs to percolate, especially among our people, because they still look on these as perversions, frown upon them. And uh, these people, even today, are subject to some amount of stigma, which is something which needs to be uh, negated through our conscious effort. Then again, certain families have an attitude of promiscuity and permitting uh, sexual liberality in a greater extent than necessary. By and large, these promiscuous individuals or families where parents manifest promiscuity do not make for a good sexual outlook in the younger people. Because we live in a psychologically attuned age, as I said earlier, 
and in a rapidly changing world, we need to adapt our attitudes to disciplining in particular and parenting in general. So we come to what is a, a different facet of upbringing that is called tough love. Now, tough love is a term coined in the, I think in the 1960s, but it came into vogue in the 1990s. And tough love speaks about if you really love your child, sometimes it is your turn to be very strict with them. It is your turn to bring them up in a fashion that they may perceive as harsh, so long as you know your good intentions are towards making this young person uh, good uh, uh, behave in a proper fashion so that he turns out to be fit for the world, then it's not necessarily bad. Now, how good is tough love? Very difficult to conclusively say that tough love is bad. I'm somebody who believes in certain degree of tough love. In other words, some degree of punishment, not of a corporal nature, generally speaking, but of deprivations and so forth, are important. But going to the level of boot camps, going to the level of uh, using harsh physical methods is definitely not uh, good. Does tough love amount to abuse? And I, I have deliberately left out my favorite topic of child abuse through this whole presentation. But suffice it to say that abuse does occur within families. Quite commonly, the perpetrators of physical, emotional, very seldom recognized emotional abuse and sexual abuse can be within the family. But we'll leave that for the discussion if we have the time. Does tough love amount to abuse? To my mind, by and large, no. When tough love was advocated, the National Institutes of Health looked at the phenomenon and a very, I forget her name now, uh, very uh, uh, vocal opponent of tough love who equated all of tough love with just the boot camp kind of uh, disciplining, strongly spoke against it. And by and large, in the US, tough love is frowned upon. On the other hand, you have the uh, think tank group in the UK, the Demos, who say that some amount of tough disciplining is indeed necessary. And they have looked at young people who have grown up with some amount of tough love in their lives, who have been grateful for the fact that tough love attended on their lives and made them better, more capable individuals to face life in a more uh, effective fashion. So opinions across the Atlantic differ as they do in so many other realms, but we won't go into all that. A final word about friendliness and parenting. I, in the practice of, I, I deal largely with adolescents and sometimes with younger children and young adults, friendliness and parenting. Now, many parents expecting a pat on the back will come and tell me, Doc, we are not like father and son, or we are not like mother and son. We are friends. I don't think this is a great attitude. I think it's important to be friendly with your child, but a parent must not be reduced to a friend of the child. There is a subtle but definite difference over here because friendliness is not amounting to becoming a friend. A child wants authority. A child wants a parent figure. A child wants to know who is boss over here. But that conveyed in a friendly fashion, going back to the, uh, one of our early slides where we spoke about authoritative uh, parenting, you can be friendly with the child, hear their opinions, and then decide what is best, sometimes giving the freedom of choice to the child also. So friendliness is important. Being a friend is not that great an attitude. It can sometimes undermine some degree of essential uh, power hierarchy within the family. Then there is a phenomenon of resilience, which is the ability of an individual to withstand the uh, stresses and traumas of life in such a way as to prevent oneself from breaking down and even developing illness. I have a nice little graphic over here of this shrub that has broken out and blossomed right in the middle of an arid, caked up uh, layer of soil. Now that, that, that uh, figuratively conveys what resilience uh, should all be about. In the event of such a breakdown, the person is able to recover quickly without developing major psychological complications. Why is this important in the context of parenting? Resilience seems to have a definite genetic component, again, harking back to genes all over again, to having resilience in one's own repertoire. Everybody has some degree of resilience. It is our job to see 
that we build up this resilience. As the scouts say, be prepared. Our preparedness to take on the onslaughts of life are very important, and that's what resilience is all about. However, and this is important for us, it is not entirely inbuilt. Resilience can be cultivated too. And resilience is best cultivated when you have a role model in the form of a parent who is quite resilient in the face of stress. So this resilience can be cultivated both consciously and as we mentioned in the context of modeling, unconsciously. And so in conclusion, we live in an age, especially in urban India, and more so in the privileged segments, where parenting is an issue of increasing sensitivity. Not, at all, not all of this is necessarily warrant, uh, warranted, but perhaps it is just as well that we have begun to pay attention to its relationship with mental health of the offspring. Today, I have attempted to cover a fairly broad canvas looking at the underpinnings of mental health of children and of adults in relationship to parenting. We have looked at both the positives and the negatives that parents bring knowingly or unknowingly into the mental lives of their offspring. There is a whole new realm, a new battlefield that technology has imposed on us and modern parenting presents its own challenges. This is just a teaser. I'm not going into this realm at all because it merits a separate consideration all by itself. Finally, the, we started with a beautiful prayer by Dr. Joseph George. This is a parent's prayer. The parent's prayer says, and this is a modification of the serenity prayer. It says, God, grant me the serenity to accept that my kids can, I will add the word, sometimes be jerks. Jerks being not so nice people. Grant me the courage not to scream at them constantly and grant me the wisdom to realize where they got it from. Because let us not forget, we've been talking about genes over and over and over again. And parents have passed on their genes to their children. Parents have passed on a set of behaviors through their interactions. And that's where the child might have become a jerk from. Something worth remembering indeed. Thank you very much for your patient listening. Thank you, the Medico Pastoral Association, in a sense, my parent organization, particularly present, uh, President Dr. Joseph George, Dr. Mohan Isaac, Ellen, that's uh, Ms. Miralini Shinde, Dr. Tailoth. I mentioned that from my window, I could see a man on the top of a tree, and he had this nickname given by me, stuck to him for life. Murli, no offense, men. I hope you can take this lightheartedly. So tree Murli, my dear chairperson for today, Thank you. Mrs. Micro Labs, Mr. Ganeshan, and Mr. Nawaz, I should have added your name, Nawab. I'm sorry, I didn't realize you're going to be here today. Thanks very much. And thank you all of you who came and listened on a Sunday afternoon. And hopefully you will have chance to interact with me either now or through my mail address, which is given below. Thank you also to my better half who came to my rescue when my presentation wasn't quite working out. She, uh, she will not like my saying this, but like as KK to Dasharatha, she came to my rescue and uh, saved the situation for me. Uh, thank you, Chanda. And uh, I'm done with my presentation for now. Yes. Uh, I think, uh, thank you, Dr. Ajit, uh, for the presentation of a very, very complex uh, uh, topic because uh, Family is a dynamic concept and it's keep on changing across. Uh, uh, there is a thing thinking that we used to think that it is on decades, but now it is changing so fast. So we do not know where uh, the whole thing ending on. And uh, it was nice that you covered uh, the concept of uh, nurture and nature and the origin of mental illness. and. Uh, Today's world, we stay, stand in the same place where we started so many years back, uh, the psychiatry itself. The other important uh, thing I just covered uh, probably is that uh, uh, people often, the current uh, training methods in uh, mental health professionals is more uh, 
the so called advancement in terms of teaching and learning methods and all where a lot of reductionistic uh, thinking going on in the medical curriculum and socio economic uh, issues like social determinants of mental health has not been given sufficient uh, uh, importance and thanks ajit for bringing that uh, onto the forefront and similarly ajit also has touched up on uh, the various family theories of schizophrenia where at that time one of the uh, very known books on schizophrenia has done a empirical testing of all these theories and has been found to be not even uh, helpful for the thing which you have rightly brought up the other important issue to uh, been brought up is that uh, the recent uh, uh, court ruling on two things one was on about the uh, the marginalized communities on sexual behavior the other important thing is that two consensual uh, uh, adults can have a sexual relationship anywhere and it is their right this is a very significant uh, thing which also can have some implications in the so called conservative or the type of system what we all propagate for the last point i would like to right uh, really or not audible last point which i would like to highlight is that uh, overall uh, such a complicated topic has been brought into a very beautiful ending and you also have emphasized the near issue of personality disorders and what we are going to see now is that from the cluster classifications of uh, personality disorders in the uh, dsm 5 will change the classification system will change on in the icd 11 to a single system now <clears throat> what i would like to uh, talk about uh, highlight about the thing before opening up the whole thing for discussion is that psychiatry and mental health itself is a dynamic phenomena and uh, we have to be open to various uh, developments which are coming up and it is important and now the session is open to all and before uh, uh, sending it for discussions i would like to also request uh, one of our very senior members <coughs> uh, professor shrinivasa murthy uh, can start initiate the discussion thank you very much murli <laughs> very nice of you <laughs> you guess that i will have something to say uh, yes, very nice. it was a very comprehensive critical and illustrative talk thank you ajit you did a very good job of it though you left out mental illness and said you'll talk about mental health you ended up talking about mental illness more than mental health anyway that's a different uh, <laughs> uh, point of view the point which i want to make is that uh, at this moment similar to the early 70s when i was a postgraduate student the meritless queue meritless schism double bind was so dominant i still remember writing my md exam on one of those uh, topics today childhood trauma has become a big thing you know adverse childhood experiences yes yes as they call it and this is going to dominate the other point which i want to say what i am seeing it i'm sure you are seeing it much more ajit nuclear families are poorly equipped to handle the mental health development of children i am saying this uh, with all sincerity because we mental health professionals will have to think of not only wait for the illness to occur but think of mechanism by which we will promote mental health in the families for the good of the children and uh, i know that the professionals are very ambivalent about it we like to talk about it but not talk about do anything about it my own personal feeling including even the 2022 mental health report which was released last week is still about mental health care not about mental health i would like to say in the next 10 years we are going to shift from mental illness to mental health and we will see it happening similar to what happened in cardiovascular medicine diabetes that we talked about exercise and nutrition we'll talk a lot more about uh, mental health and uh, skills from the beginning itself for people lastly i want to uh, place on record mrs kapoor's uh, major contribution in this area particularly her recent book which i had the opportunity to review for indian journal of psychiatry meant uh, that is uh, it's okay to reach out for help is a beautiful compilation of many cultural factors 
which promote mental health. I wish MPA would set aside some evening only for mental health so that people can come and say, look, how can I become a better person? Like they go to a beautician and say, how can I have a look more beautiful? And I think it will happen in the next 10 years. I keep talking about it, but most people don't seem to buy it. But it's been a brilliant talk. Thank you very much, uh, Ajit. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, I think it's important. Uh, and uh, let us uh, have at least about five to 10 minutes uh, questions or uh, the comments or impressions from uh, part, uh, participants. To, uh, uh, either you can directly ask to Ajit or you can even write uh, uh, in the chat box also. While I wait for uh, reactions, I mean, uh, more questions, may I say something in the context of what Dr. Srinivas said? Yeah, yeah, I, uh, I think, please. I think it was a very valid point about uh, what's happening. I mean, for one is, of course, he has been an advocate of this, as a few of us have also been, the, or speak more about health and less about illness. But you cannot avoid talking about illness when we bring health into the picture. And I particularly was very upset when, uh, uh, as recently as six months ago, I had a father who was blaming the mother's behavior entirely for the child's psychotic breakdown. An extremely well-read father who could also poke uh, uh, a rather uh, find fault with uh, genetic theories of uh, uh, psychological breakdown. Uh, both parents are scientists. The child has had a, psycho a psychotic breakdown and he was clinging so much to this schizophrenogenic mother model and I, I was at my wit's end fighting that. But I think what uh, Dr. Murthy mentioned about in terms of the nuclear family and what that has brought into our lives, the slow atrophy of the joined family. And this atrophy at a time when loneliness is becoming more and more epidemic, as Vivek Murthy tells us, that there's an epidemic of loneliness that is happening. So having no grandparent, no extended family support, and not even relating properly to your neighbors, you hardly know your neighbor's name, let alone their profession or what they do, especially in these uh, high rise buildings where uh, you, you barely see each other's faces. I think this is going to impose a huge burden on psychological life, generally speaking. So the, the paradigm that the, the the uh, metaphor that has been used is the paradise lost paradigm. Okay, tell me your now. Come on. Oh. There's a sign of good health for you. Uh, the <laughs> the uh, important thing is that we need to have social networks that will compensate for this paradise that we are losing over a period of time. And I don't know exactly how we are going to go about it, but I think connectedness is going to be tremendously important and artificial as it may seem, it has to be begun and it has to be cultivated over a period of years. It cannot happen over months or days, days or months. Uh, Dr. Murli, if I may, I have two yeah, questions. Please, please. please. Uh, so I wanted uh, some support or some help in understanding what, what you have to say about uh, children who have schizophrenic parents. So um, I'm coming across a lot of clients who have schizophrenic mothers, especially, where uh, the point that you mentioned that there is uh, a loss of trust and a difficulty in maintaining intimate relationships, uh, forming and maintaining. So why why is there a loss of trust first and secondly how do we sort of help someone who is in that sort of space i think it's a very important question yeah. and i think we are seeing more and more of this uh the uh parent who has a mental illness and the offspring who have to suffer as a result of the parental mental illness uh one is that the child is very often overburdened with the thought that he or she may have a similar uh, breakdown and I think that that needs addressing, but that was not specifically your question. Your question was, why do these, why do these people have uh, a, a lowered self-esteem? Why do these people have a lack of trust? 
because i think we use our parents as sort of darpanas on the yardstick by which we measure ourselves against the world and if that measuring system is faulty then we tend to get a skewed picture which is not one of a reality and as a result of this we have a feeling that we are not very worthy that we deserve somebody with an aberrant mind as our parent that we now so we can't hear you Uh, I can't hear you. Psychological. Just a minute. <coughs> can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that th that is the uh, uh, tricky part of it. There is not enough research data to tell us exactly why the self-esteem gets lowered. And what is the other uh, facet of uh, psychological life that you did mention, which is lack of trust. Lack of Because trust. Your your in this this darpana as i said is is our measuring tool and if my parents are inadequate then i don't know whom to trust when when i when i do not have a parent who will give me a sense of fulfillment my overall feeling with the world is one of inadequacy does that make sense to you or not enough i think <laughs> uh, it it does so the the point that i was also kind of struggling with is um also too much information online about having schizophrenic parents and uh then they read up on that and say that oh okay my mom doesn't trust my dad so she's always suspicious about him now i am very suspicious about my fiance or my boyfriend um so does this mean that i'm going to become schizophrenic yes. as well if, if you remember the modeling a slide where we looked at the negative suspiciousness is easily modeled very very easily modeled and this was a study done from a developing country where they looked at when you have paranoid parents how easily the young person grows up with suspiciousness as part of the young person's repertoire not yet of delusional proportions so that, that that's something that is picked up very fast especially between the ages of 5 and 15 and that can become deeply ingrained if it's not dealt with adequately at younger age that was one point so the other one i wanted uh, uh, some thoughts from you about narcissistic parents and anxiety among children as a result uh, you know with lower self esteem and... not being a heavily theologically oriented person heaven help them uh, who have both <laughs> narcissistic parents but a narcissistic single parent is bad enough to bring a lot of misery into a family's life okay so when you have a narcissistic parent the anxiety is not the result disgust is the very common result because you're tired of hearing this parent going on and on and on about how he is great how he has not got what he deserves in life how he deserved much better from uh, powers that be uh, generally speaking and that's a, that's that's something that merits a separate consideration by itself when we speak about uh, narcissism as a phenomenon narcissism does not very commonly beget anxiety but a narcissistic parent who is also psychopathic can drive a person can drive their children to behaviors uh, sorry to a uh, repertoire where they become very anxious because they are expected to fulfill this person's narcissistic needs all the time and if they fail to do so they are punished for it covertly and overtly and that can contribute to some form of breakdown in the long run so recognizing narcissistic patterns is something very important for young people and to be able to deal with them in the long run is something which counselors need to uh, arm the young person with thank you thank you sir uh oh, thank you it is any more uh, uh, questions uh, i think otherwise i may have to uh, ask people to respond because this is a very very important topic having contemporary relevance Uh, uh i would like to ask uh, ramola uh, with your uh, vast experience with the mpa and uh, uh, can you suggest uh, and do in order counseling ramola is not difficult there difficult question you put to me 
Yeah, yeah. What is what, what is your only. what is your experience and how you have uh, looked at this particular area over the years? Well, uh, like I said once before, we had what was known as the family cottage at MP, where the family members of the people who were residents there would come and stay, so that they could learn how we were adjusting with the with the resident and they could learn from the counselors it's a long process there's no some simple one answer for it uh, because each person is so different so each one has to be treated in that particular way each each parenting is also so different but yes uh, like what ajit said i agree that you know maybe the counselors also need to be trained specifically how to deal with this uh, situation. It's not an easy situation. It is really quite difficult. Yeah, that uh, uh, it's quite interesting where uh, what uh, Dr. Uh, Ramola has uh, talked about because the Udika Pastor Association today is a, uh, the 50th year of existence and has done a, an experiment for the first time in the country. By keeping this in mind only, I requested Ramola to speak about that because uh, MPA had given a lot of importance from the beginning itself for the families of the patients and which has not been an institutionalization if you really look at the term of institutionalizing a patient in a residential rehabilitation facility so we have been uh, very very positive about the way things have been looked at it now uh, uh, ajit do you want to comment on this no not particularly i think okay. what needed to be said has been said okay then uh, uh, I, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Pandian the, uh, from Nimans, uh, who can also contribute uh, towards this. Pandian, Professor Pandian. Okay. Sir, thank you so much, sir, for yeah. this great opportunity. I am extremely grateful to the lecture organized by the Medical Pastoral Association. I am extremely grateful to Dr. Ajit Bede for the wonderful contribution. In fact, I could uh, have a great opportunity to listen to Dr. Ajit Bile after a long, long time. I am extremely thankful to you, sir. My sincere thanks to the entire team for the wonderful thing. I once again thank the entire team of Medical Pastoral Association for organizing this wonderful lecture on this wonderful occasion, sir. Thank you so much. Thanks, Pandyan. Thanks for your remarks in the chat box also. Uh, um, and Dr. Murari? Yes, please. Um, Dr. Ajit, I have one question with regard to the gene factor. Um, there is a lot of confusion about what percentage of the gene factor contribute to mental illness. Um, different, differing views on that. I know some, a few uh, uh, counselees, uh, their parents are not they do not reflect any symptoms of any disorder, including schizophrenia or depression, etc. But somebody in the second or the grandpa grandparents or great grandparents, one of them was mentally ill, and that is showing now in the younger generation. So, how do we explain that gene factor? Parents do not, do not have symptoms, but uh, the, the family tree shows somebody in the family it was. So the gene factor is sometimes quite confusing. Some some uh, clarity on that I would like to hear. And the second is uh, the first time I heard the word pseudo mutuality and pseudo hostility. At times in counseling, we tell the, the counselees that the couple who are always argumentative fighting in front of the children we tell you know one of the technique we tell them is you need to stop fighting in front of the children so that counseling technique technique is not contributing to pseudo mutuality that is my question thank you uh, very very uh, valid question i would say this much that covering up for the time being is what we are telling the a uh, couple when, when sorry i've taken the second question first yeah so over there when we tell them not to fight in front of the child we are not saying do not sort out your differences do not bring up the hostility in front of the children because it aggravates their sense of insecurity when they have to 
uh, when, they, when, they, when they need a, a firm, stable atmosphere in which to grow up. But by all means, when the children are not present, try to iron out your differences and most importantly, learn the strategy of agreeing to disagree on a few principles, on a few matters, and have the principle that there will be give and take. Some, some decisions you take, some decisions I take. There's that old joke about major decisions and minor decisions, but we won't go into jokes right now. That's, that, that's important. The uh, pseudo mutuality is not what you impose. Pseudo mutuality is something that occurs within families. And because the hostility in pseudo mutuality is buried under the surface, that is why it was thought that it contributes in the long run to um, psychotic breakdown. And pseudo mutuality, it was believed, leads to psychotic breakdowns at a time when psychoanalysis ruled the roost and unconscious mechanisms were given way too much weightage for which there was no robust scientific evidence. Pseudo hostility is as though you just have to establish that you are in a hostile interaction with the other and want to assert yourself by opposing the other just for the sake of opposing and saying, I have a different uh, point of view. Even though deep down you may have a sin. That can be quite dangerous. And that contributes a lot to unstable personalities. We see pseudo mutuality and pseudo hostility much more in what is the, a well-known condition of stable instability. That is a borderline uh, uh, personality disorders. We see, we see that kind of a pathological pattern over there. The uh, first question about genes, I think we do not know enough about how genes operate. What we know for sure is that there is an on and off mechanism. So every gene is not operating all the time. That's for sure. We know of certain phenomena where a generation is skipped and this happens quite a lot with mental illness. It's not manifest in the, uh, uh, the young adult or the generation, the parents that have come here, but the child has an illness and the grandparent has an illness or a first cousin has an illness. What causes the genes to go on and off are factors that are slowly getting elucidated with illnesses such as cystic fibrosis, which is an organic illness, with certain forms of colitis, which is also an organic illness. We are far from elucidation of these factors. What causes genes to get switched on when it comes to mental illness uh, just yet? But the genes seem to operate mainly through our neurochemicals, the uh, neurotransmitter systems, where certain neurotransmitters in large amounts are prone to bring about a, a psychotic kind of behavior. They get switched on and that, that's how they become manifest. So this riddle is still early in its stage of being solved. We are nowhere near definite solutions. I would urge you to read a book by, uh, the, by Mukherjee, who wrote about the emperor of all maladies. He has subsequently written a book where he talks about the genetics of mental illness in his own family. And uh, I, I, I can pass on the title to you. Siddhartha Mukherjee is the name of the author. And uh, he, he's written about mental breakdown and the fact how genes operate. Of course, that book is also dated, but I don't think genetics have advanced that much in the last nine years since that book was written. Thank you. I think uh, Thank you so much. Uh, uh, we request uh, Professor Mohan, I said. So mute. Thank you. Thank you, Murli, for asking me to speak. Uh, I wrote in the chat box uh, that it was an excellent talk. Lots of things covered in a very simple language, in a layperson's language. And my comment was very honest comment. Uh, I wish I listened to Ajit's talk about 45 years ago uh, when my children were young and they were coming up and uh, many of the things that uh, uh, he mentioned, I could remember in my own family with my own children. I have a son and a daughter with two years difference. But my great consolation is, my, I noticed, I haven't seen, but I noticed from the name that my uh, son is attending. I knew that he was traveling from Kerala to Bangalore and I didn't know whether, I, I still don't know whether he's attending through a mobile, but I had certainly sent him the uh, poster. So he has three children, six years, uh, three years and one year. 
So I'm sure what I could not benefit, he will benefit from your talk. Uh, that is, of course, my personal comment. The other comment I had, I have already put in the chat box uh, because uh, Ro uh, Rohini asked, in Australia, there is an organization called COPMI, C-O-P-M-I. Uh, that is uh, run by uh, a non-governmental organization, Emerging Minds. COPMI stands for Children of Parents with Mentally Ill. It is a big problem, lots of which, and uh, uh, Rohini wanted a lot of resources. If you go, to, this is for anybody. If you just uh, Google COPMI, their website, Emerging Minds, I think is the name of the organization. Lots of, uh, you know, video material, uh, chats between experts and parents uh, or children who have this, etc. There are a lot of resources available for anybody who wants some more information on this. Otherwise, it has been a wonderful talk. We are delighted that, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, and I have been carefully noticing our attendees and every time we have new uh, attendees uh, for uh, our MTA Golden Jubilee lectures and uh, uh, of course, Ajit's uh, lecture will be edited by our staff who are becoming more and more proficient in this job and it will soon be available. So if any of your colleagues or friends, uh, you know, you listen to this talk and uh, you wish though my so-and-so friend who has a 10-year-old son who is a problem person wants to listen, you write to the Administrator of Medical Pastoral Association and he'll be very happy to send you the YouTube link in the next one week or so. Uh, uh, so that would be available. Back to you, Rohan. Uh, Murli. Thank you, sir. Uh, that's a very uh, important uh, suggestion, Derek. Uh, now, MBA as uh, uh, organization, uh, we have uh, been doing this work, but I feel that the transfer of technology to the other centers is going to be very, very significant because we have to have uh, uh, 50 years is good enough for us to say that, uh, uh, okay, we know something about, at least something about how to manage a residential care facility with the uh, uh, parental support or family support of mentally ill. That's great, sir. Uh, any other uh, uh, comments or discussions? And please feel free because this is not a very uh, uh, strong forum where people are going to uh, oppose or uh, agree or to disagree or whatever it is. So please participate. If no more uh, comments are there, then uh, I may uh, ask uh, Ajit, uh, do you, would you like to say a few more last closing comments and then I will close the session and hand it over to Rohini. Sir, if or... I may, I had one more question. Yeah, please. <laughs> I'm sorry. I had actually said it yes. in the chat, but I, I guess I just wanted to understand what should one tell adult children of schizophrenic parents when they worry if they will inherit, you know, the same. And if there is some precautionary measure that they could look for to prevent an onset in them or in their children. So they ask questions like, uh, can mental strengthening help me fight the genetic component? Um, how do you answer something like that? Does it really help? Is there something called mental strengthening that can help? So uh, developing mental resilience is something which can be worked on. There is no robust data to suggest that this can be prevented through this message, through this method. But at the same time, there is nothing to suggest that it does not work. So being connected, being open to not, not piling up stresses inside you and allowing for de-stress mechanisms Indulging in ventilation, indulging in group uh, groups where you can talk about your anxieties is one important stratagem that I think is not adequately emphasized. We, we must give this uh, person that chance to open up and talk. Having healthy pursuits which divert the mind from the uh, toll of everyday life and one immediately reaches out for a bottle of liquor, but that's a very unhealthy way of coping with stress, to have creative hobbies where one gives of oneself, playing a musical instrument, gardening, carpentry, uh, zondra gardening, like collecting medicinal plants, getting totally devoted to some particular subject, whether it's uh, not the right thing to say at this moment, but let's say Mughal history, or whether you want to go back to learning a classical language. These are creative hobbies which demand of you 
and which you can enjoy the fruits of in the long run. Should not be very taxing on you, but be, if you indulge in a creative hobby, the chances of your having a mental breakdown, it has been shown. And these studies actually come, from, come to us from epidemiological studies of cardiology. They, they seem to uh, create a sort of insurance against mental breakdown in the long run. Also be aware of the signs and symptoms of mental illness and be sensitive enough as soon as you see any of those actually occurring in you to go to a professional and seek that professional person's help. These are the strategies that I would think of. I, I would also uh, uh, say that most people that one and 10 and 90 and 99 statistic that I gave you is an important reinforcer for people to have confidence that the chances of breakdown, even though they are higher, are remote. Yes, totally. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is uh, since uh, Rohini raised this problem about children of mentally ill, adult, uh, adult children of mentally ill. I just, this is just again a piece of information. And uh, this is, of course, in the public domain. There is a very well known trust which does work for mentally ill people from marginalized sections of the society, particularly women. It is called Bapu Trust. The founder of that is a uh, uh, well known psychologist by name Bhargavi Tower. Uh, in the Wikipedia, she is there. You can Google this Bapu Trust. Now, she is a mental health care advocate, activist, etc. But if you read about her, much of her inspiration to become a psychologist, to become a mental health care activist, uh, to start the Bapu Trust, etc., came from seeing her as she grew up. See, she saw her mother who had a uh, uh, chronic schizophrenia. He has written about it. Others who have written about Bhargavi Tower has written about her talk, etc. She has talked about it in the Mansa several years ago. So you Google for Bhargavi Tower and Bapu Trust. And uh, so the point I'm making is I just talked about resilience. You know, I mean, uh, you don't have to only think of, oh, are there genes? My parents said this, but uh, there are any number of other examples. This is only one example from India, not very far away. But there are any number of examples of children of people with uh, schizophrenia doing extremely well, becoming very resilient, etc. I just wanted to add, because I think uh, Roni is obsessed with the idea of children of uh, mentally ill people. <laughs> you may still have doubts. Dr. Murthy has shared the name of Siddhartha Mukherjee's book, as well as another uh, book by Dr. Sanjay Gupta. Dr. Murthy, is this uh, Sanjay Gupta, the psychiatrist from Varanasi? No. I think Dr. Dr. Murthy has left, perhaps. No, Ajit uh, is Sanjay Gupta, who is the CNN medical uh, medical correspondent of the CNN uh, channel. Okay. Yeah, Dr. Murthy is there. Ah, he has written of CNN. Uh, he has responded in the chat box. Anita, I wanted to make any comments. Uh, if there if there are no comments, I, I have a question to Ajit. Uh, the recent trend of uh, slowing down the life uh, on families, like instead of uh, uh, time bound programs and work so much and uh, uh, take a lot of stressors. And what is your take on that? Uh, I think we have both entered that age bracket, Murli. You are a little behind me, uh, but we are, we are now uh, in an age where we should slow down to the pace of life. We should not be in a, a desperate hurry to get anywhere. We've got where we needed to get. We should not back off from life. We should not uh, press only the brake. Gentle accelerator and second and third gear, I think, is where we ought to belong. And I think that's important. Going on uh, in the top gear is not something that bef befits most people in our age bracket and most people with our type of temperaments. I think we have to slow down. We have to get down to a place where we look back on life with some degree of uh, satisfaction, with some degree of some lamentation. Maybe that I could have done this. I've still not gone to the Great Wall of China. You have. Uh, but I think mm -hmm. some dreams remain unf unfulfilled. And, uh, we can make our peace with it. So I think it's important not to be in the rat race beyond 
a certain age. And I think arbitrarily, I think that age is around 50, 55. I, I don't know whether I'm answering your question. No, what I was talking about, uh, there is a lifestyle which is being propagated across uh, across ages to slow down and uh, go on. Uh, one of the, uh, I raised this issue is that uh, I have uh, a patient's parent, uh, uh, one of them is a delivery boy. So they are worried whether uh, the timing and uh, they have to go and uh, deliver the material so far and then what will happen. And especially in Bangalore traffic, anything can happen. Uh, oh, that's true. So I, I have to tell that anything can happen. That, that's a true uh, reality. Now, the, but there is a, a group of people across the world trying to say that, okay, you don't have to really go on space uh, in all ages. You go according to what uh, is convenient and comfortable for you. Uh, but at the same time, don't, uh, go to a stage where what uh, Ashtavakra talks about. Uh, Ashtavakra Gita. Yes. <laughs> so but, but I would say this much. Uh, uh, I'll go back to my fondness for literature. I'll say Eugene O'Neill wrote a play called Morning Becomes Electra. I think speed becomes a certain age. Wanting to be on the accelerator becomes a certain age. I certainly think that Formula One racing has, has its place in life but not for people who have crossed the uh, five decades of life. I think uh, everybody need not slow down, but when you reach a certain age, I think it's time to start slowing down. I'm perhaps repeating myself, but I think that's very, very important. And unnecessarily pressing the accelerator can, can bring, bring on misery much more than not being on the accelerator. Any more uh, uh, comments are there? It was an excellent uh, talk. If any more comments are there, uh, I can take it up. If it is not, then uh, I would like to hand over the uh, Charles Rohini because uh, Ajit, congratulations for uh, bringing such a wonderful topic to a uh, understandable way because uh, it's a very complex and dynamic in nature. So thank you, Ajit, for a wonderful talk. And I thank uh, MPA all the uh, our colleagues in the uh, committee uh, thanks for allowing me to have the um, as a moderator for this session it is a big great honor thank you i was honored to have you as my chair because i was very worried that i may not have you as my chair because you were slated to go abroad in fact i yes. said this is your name and then said i think you're going abroad but yeah. <laughs> bon voyage bon voyage for your trip thank, thank you friends um, there's um... Dr. Murthy says there are new books of remedial interventions following childhood trauma. If you would like to have information, kindly write to him. And his email is also shared with you on the, on the chat box. Please come on. I would like to hand over back to Rohini. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Murthy. Thank you, Adit, sir. Um, parents do not parent and children do not grow up in isolation, but in multiple contexts. There are reasons, there are contributing factors, there are environments. And the more we understand and accept this, the more what we can and cannot control, I think we are better equipped to become decent human beings and raise tiny little decent human beings ourselves. So um, thank you so much, um, Ajit, sir, for putting this up.